I was born here. Mm -hmm. mm. Yes, my parents came up from Melbourne just after the war. Father was transferred, found a, a little place in Mossman to rent, and uh, being fairly impoverished, having come out of the army, uh, they looked to how could they enjoy a weekend at minimal expense, and Balmoral was the obvious choice. And uh, you may remember a little kiosk next to where the beach club is, which would sell hot water. Uh, I'm sure that'll be in the council's records, hot water for a penny or whatever to make you tea. So they'd pack up their sandwiches and then somebody said, well, why don't you join the beach club right next door with picnic facilities and a place to change. They were not keen racers, but uh, that was where I grew up. Summer weekends with picnics at the beach club as a, as a key part. Just up in Tivoli Street, uh, up on Balmoral, Balmoral Heights, I suppose it's called now. It wasn't called that those days, it was just Balmoral. Yes, yes, uh, able to scrape up enough money in the, in the 50s and bought the house, so that was the, the residence. Mm -hmm. My brother and I used to wish that the house was close to the beach. That long walk up Stanton Road uh, on a hot summer's day was uh, for little kids it seemed an eternity, but uh, no, that's great exercise and a, a wonderful upbringing. I remember the chambers running. I vaguely remember being on them once or twice, but I can remember the chambers running down to the old terminus. We still call it the tram shed, uh, the bus shelter down there. I still refer to it as the tram shed. It's uh, in interesting how it's six in the nine, because I started school down at Balmoral Infant School when I think the trams would have still been running in 55. That dates one a bit, because uh, I think the trams only finished a couple of years later. Then. Mm. The club was re about the formation was early 1914, and they went and bought some land. And Mick Featherston, I think, sold them the parcel of the land. So it is actually freehold title. And Mick Featherston was Featherston's Hall down the southern end, down near where the infant school has been. And uh, they built a, a building which was finished by the end of 1914, formally opened in 1915. So that's the one you see on the front cover of the Beach Club's history at that time. And uh, there are a couple of trams in there as well. I'm not quite sure whether the trams predated that, but um, we used to joke that the trams were for the women out the back. But uh, though that building would have lasted until about the 1930s, obviously with additions, and then the club was rebuilt significantly with a two-storey building then additions since. Some of the foundation members um, have had links all the way down to the present. One of them was E.O. Marath, and he had three young lads whose picture appears in the picture of the opening of the Beach Club building in 1915. Uh, Clem, Lou and Vin Marath, and uh, Lou's son, Dickie Marath, is still a very keen competitor, and his daughters, and now their daughters, are they're still members, so what's that, five generations? One of those brothers was Clem Rath. Clem never had any kids himself, but nevertheless he took such a keen interest in getting kids how to swim that the club's records show that he trained over 3,000 or taught over 3,000 kids how to, to learn how to swim. And that was at the back lawn. This was over a period of 30 or 40 years before Learn to Swim classes came along from the government. That's very recent, only in the 70s, late 70s. And, uh, on those learn to swim classes, there are pictures of us lying out on the back lawn, and that's where I learned to swim. I still can't kick some of the habits that I learned there. We'd be lying out on the back lawn with our, on our towels, kicking up and down as little kids, and then taking the big old wooden hollow surf uh, kicking boards down to the rock pool before it's silted up, and uh, swimming up and down there. And there's a story which uh, you may have heard that. Clem apparently was keen for many years in writing to the council even to say, could we have a proper swimming pool at Balmoral up in the northern end of the beach? Because he thought that the rock pool was not up to the scratch. And uh, the story goes that probably it would have meant blasting holes out of wire gene point. Just imagine what the reaction would be today to have a, like a, a beach or a surf swimming pool. But in 1989, I think it was, uh, when Barry O'Keefe was the mayor. He asked me to go down and said that they wanted to honour Clem, the council wanted to honour Clem's contribution and named the Clem Rath Pool, uh, named it the Clem Rath Pool. And there was a little plaque, I don't know if it's still there, commemorating 
that uh, with speeches, etc., as a, a recognition of what he had done and others working with him after Clem had dropped it. And I remember coaching little kids for many years as club captain doing that. It appears that the regular Shark Watch probably only, or the only records that are in the, shark, in the club's history, uh, 75th history, was of the Shark Watch set up after the war, after the Second War, with young men up in the amphitheatre, the Star Amphitheatre, issued with binoculars to search out for the sharks. And then they would use a signal down to the beach club, which would then ring the shark alarm bell at the club. That, of course, meant that on a long sunny day that everyone was focused on the sharks. Rumour has it that uh, some of the young lads with their binoculars may have been watching more activity on the beach, but that would be normal. Um, th I don't know, if we haven't got records of shark alarms being sounded, presumably they were from time to time. Uh, but it was a real threat and I remember as a kid, uh, my parents were very adamant that you did not swim outside the net anywhere at, at dusk or anywhere near dawn or dusk. And that went back to that young lad being taken off Wajin Point. And that would have been when I was about five, so it was very clear in our memories. And even now, we think twice about swimming around the island down to the bars. The old timers do. Others, you see, swimming out in the middle of the bay and think, I wouldn't be doing that. There is a shark bell. It's been restored. It's up in the club now. It, it's, it was there in my youth. I don't recall it having been rung for a shark, but it may have been done when I wasn't there. And then it disappeared over the years and is now just a bit of a, a historical artefact being polished up and sit, sits inside the club room. One of the things that we keep emphasising to people coming into the club, and I think some of the existing members could be reminded that it's a beach club, not a swimming club, and that was always the origin with those smugglers. They didn't go down there to have swimming races. They went to have a place to change on the weekend, to socialise, to uh, be able to enjoy each other's company. And that's really what we've sought to preserve within the Beach Club, that sense that it is, I won't say home away from home, but it certainly has been for a number of people over the years. And uh, we had used to have a lot of social activities. That ebbs and flows depending on social attitudes. Balls and dinner dances and smokers were very popular back in the past. Uh, there isn't the same demand for that these days, so it tends to be uh, more dining. So we have brunches, extended uh, early morning swim or meals after a swim, which is a great meeting place. Instead of frequenting the local cafes, we tend to continue the camaraderie upstairs and, uh, and chat on. But they've also more recently been introduced bridge, yoga, uh, storytellers clubs where people come down and spin their yarns. Um, I think there are other things under consideration, perhaps some on the menu side, and we have special activities from time to time. But with a club of 2,000 members, uh, not all of those are going to be swimming. If we get 100 swimmers in a race, it's getting crowded. And so overall, we'd be lucky to get 300 members of the club actually participating in events. So that's, what, 15%, 20%. It's, it's still a lot of people individually, but that's not what the club's primary aim is, though that is where the camaraderie from people using it all the time often comes from. Uh, we introduced the Nippers program, all oh, about 10 years ago, 15 years ago, I can't be sure. My daughters were in the early couple of years. I think they might have found some of the young, the young boys a little rough on the, some of the beach events. But it's uh, really taken off. And as always happens here, it's when a club member says, well, I've got a young kid or there's a particular interest that motivates them to take some leadership on it. And Peter McCormick was very keen in those early days of setting that up with his wife. And that's been passed on several times, several baton changes. And now it's grown to, I think there's about 600 registrations a year. So it's huge, split up with age groups. Uh, each age group has a parent who administers it. A rule is that if you want your kid to be involved, you become involved. So it's, it really is a, an all-in activity. And of those, uh, there's a priority given to club members re-registering, but it's still op it's open to the public. So it's, it's part, if you like, of that extended community spirit as well. After the rush of the early morning swimmers has gone, and as you probably know, the first bunch go at 5.30 every morning, every day of the year, through winter. So they'd hate daylight saving, because <laughs> they lose that time. With different groups coming through every sort of half hour or hour until 7.30, 8 o'clock. But around about 9 o'clock, 9.30 when the mob had gone, some of the retired older group would come down and make themselves a cup of tea. Oh, they'd go for a swim first. 
then come in, dry off, make themselves a cup of tea, and then sit around and sort out the world's problems in their deck chairs, soaking up the sun. And uh, so why you don't need to get dressed if there's nobody else around at that time. Yeah. So they were colloquially called the bear Asked Parliament. <coughs> Members included Pat Morton, who is a former mayor, local member, patron of the Beach Club, minister for uh, local government, I think, at the time too. Uh, old Frank Mason, whose son became the Chief Justice of the High Court. Um, Lance White, who is the Chief Engineer at the Water Board. A whole raft of people and others who a uh, chap called Smokey Dawson or Dickie Dawson who would have all sorts of ribald stories to tell. Um, and it was a collection open to all because it didn't matter what your status was in the beach club, you were even no business, no titles. In respect of the club's formation, certainly the first the meeting, the public meeting that was held to form the beach club based on the smuggler's suggestion, why don't we form a club out of this, was chaired by the local mayor at the time, Mayor Piggott and certainly members of the, uh, <coughs> the council and the club were interchangeable in those early years, uh, taking an active interest yeah. both ways. And I think from my reading before that uh, one of the original Beach Club councillors, Beach Club members on the committee, was in fact the Chief Justice of New South Wales at the time, Sir William Cullen. Uh, but yes, there was a close link with Jack Carroll and others with the council and that we've sought to preserve that. We see ourselves very much as a member of the community and even when we rebuilt the club a few years ago, we consciously stepped away from designs that would make the club appear that it was lording over the beach to something which was more modest and uh, less conspicuous with that in mind. And we sought to preserve that and it was through activities we used to contribute to local fund uh, activities through the council, the reader book and other matters. I think some of that might have fallen by the wayside, the local um, hospital etc. Because being a, a club that is not a trading club, we don't make a profit and we don't think that we should be steering members' charitable contributions according to what we think. So this was only if the club is generating funds. And we organise the cancer swim each year down at Bamor, or at least the beach club members do. So that's a major activity on it. Uh, but that link with the council, one of the, <coughs> excuse me, one of it was epitomised when Dom Lopez was in the chair many years ago at council. And I caught up with him on a weekend though when I was door knocking with the salvos and he said, uh, we'd like, we the council would like to recognise what the Beach Club does with its involvement with young people. We'd like to introduce a, a youth award and the plaque at the Beach Club is the Mayor's Youth Award and we invite the Mayor each year to come down and present it to the junior member who's made the most contribution to the activities of the Beach Club. As far as I'm concerned, I will make every effort to keep it what I call accessible and affordable. Uh, it's very keen to avoid it becoming elitist in any way or just a professional person's club, something that anybody could join. It's, it's harder and harder these days with funds, etc. But um, I like to quote when I'm introducing new members to the club in a little historical spiel along the lines of what we've been talking about here, that uh, it was Pat Morton as the patron who said to us, you've got something special going for you at the Beach Club, make sure you don't lose it. And that's what we certainly seek to do, to keep it open to anybody. They don't have to be wealthy, they don't have to be professional, and to be aff so that's both affordability and accessibility. Yes, that's our goal, and we'll strive to maintain that.